Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Lead to thy God to order and provide. Tell of the sorrow we bore. 
was rejected and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in the story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me sleep on the whisper. Love, pay the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Rise on my heart. Thank you, Brother Herb, for leading the folks, and thank you for being here. And uh, I always read some emails before I start. These are people that live around the country and around the world. We live stream every Wednesday night at 6.30 Central Standard Time here in America, and then we live, that's on Wednesday night, and then we live stream Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock Central Standard Time. And these are people that write to us and they're interested in the ministry. A lot of them are, some of them are not, because they'll tell me that when they correct me in this. But uh, Sharon in North Carolina writes to us. She says, hello all. It's so good to see Brother Jim back and running. Many prayers and thoughts of health and wellness to you all. Thank you for all you do, Agape, Sharon, in North Carolina. We love you, Sharon. Keep writing. Mike Brooke in Canada writes, Hello, Jim, Mary, Tom, and the church. Much Agape and Phileo to all. Long time I didn't write. I was busy with work and the little cares of the world. I have a TikTok channel where I preach predestination, death to self, self-denial. Well, good for you. I also share some of your videos. In the videos I produce, I define Greek words from the concordance word by word. Recently, I was inspired to write a couple of predestination songs in hip-hop style. I don't know if that's good or not. <laughs> in hip-hop, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Uh, I don't know. I'm not eloquent, but I am able to get the message across. I really think Jim can enjoy this for a minute or two. Tom, if you can show Pastor Jim what I do, it would be very appreciated. This is the link for one of the latest songs. He sends that. Thanks, Agape and Phileo. I will write soon. Mike Brook in Canada. Keep writing to us, Mike. We appreciate it. We love you, brother. Then Jim, this is from Ryan Spears. Ryan is kind of up and down. He struggles daily. In study 4330, I saw on the wall behind you stuff that says the mark of the beast. Well, I think I already read that. That's not the mark of the beast up there. That's the Star of David. Uh, I thought we couldn't repent once we get the mark. You're not paying attention to my messages. I've already said the mark was the character of the beast. What did you say the mark is? Christmas, communion, baptism? Well, in a sense, they are because they're an easy gospel. They are a gospel that compromises the truth. Water baptism and communion is not what they were doing. And communion, it was that they were having uh, Passover. And Christmas is Christ's Mass, it's Roman Catholicism. 
I probably couldn't repent once we got the mark of the beast. <laughs> no, that Bible doesn't say that. You've kind of got that wrong. All right. We appreciate you writing to us. Keep on writing. Ross Belcito in New York. He writes, Agape and Phileo, Grace and Truth Ministry. Hey, Brother Jim. Hey, Mark. I have a question. I'm a little confused. Why would they think that they could anoint Jesus' body with the prepared oil the day after the Sabbath? I don't believe they did. This, he was buried on the day before the he was buried on the day before the Sabbath and he was in the tomb. They couldn't go in there and anoint him when Jesus was locked in a tomb and guarded. Thank you all for all you do. See, you're going to have to give me chapter and verse so I can answer the chapter and verse for you. Ross Balcito in New York. Melissa Hussein, she is in Holland. She writes to us from time to time. Uh, she's in the Netherlands, and they call that Holland over there. Uh, dear Pastor Jim Mary and congregation, I hope this email finds you all in good health and high spirits. I wanted to reach out and express our heartfelt gratitude for your ongoing teaching and guidance, which have continued to inspire and enrich our lives even in these challenging times. First and foremost, please accept our sincerest apologies for not writing as frequently as we would like to write. Though we may have been quiet in our correspondence, please know that you and the entire congregation have been constantly in our thoughts and prayers. Your tireless dedication and selfless service to the community have left an indelible impact on our spiritual journey and we hold immense gratitude for the ways in which you have helped us grow in faith and understanding additionally i wanted to share a personal update with you all in february i underwent a knee operation which required my full focus and attention during the re recovery period while it had been a challenging journey I am grateful for the successful procedure and the progress I am making on my road to recovery. Please convey our messages of appreciation and apologies to the entire congregation as we highly value our church family. Your presence and fellowship have been a source of great comfort and community throughout our collective journey of faith. Once again, please accept our apologies for our limited communication during this period. We assure you that we are actively learning and absorbing the valuable teaching you continue to impart, striving to embody them in our daily lives. May God's love and blessing continue to guide and strengthen you, Pastor Jim, and Mary, as you lead our congregation with unwavering dedication and grace. With warmest regards, Melissa Hossein in the Netherlands. She's a dear lady. We love you, Melissa, just with all our heart. We hope someday you can come over here and see us. I got some YouTube comments. They don't always like me. Tim Williams writes, commented on predestination is about the boundary of God here on earth. And then he says, he doesn't like me at all. He's kind of a dimwit. He says, if we are predestined for heaven or hell, then why create all of this? Because God wanted to. He creates all things after the counsel of his own will. If I did it, I wouldn't make any vessels of wrath and fit them for destruction. But he did. You haven't read Romans 9, have you? You haven't read Romans 8 or Ephesians, the first chapter, or all over the Bible. Why make anyone? You're just you're just ignorant. You don't care what the Bible says. Why condemn some to hell and some to heaven without rhyme or reason? It's God's rhyme and God's reason. He reasons and he says, I do it all he's 
chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, having predestinated us into the adoption of the children according to the good pleasure of his will. He wants to. You don't like the attitude of God, do you? What makes you get to pass to heaven and someone else not? It's called grace. Grace, charis, means unmerited favor. You're just dumb as a rock, Buster. I mean, you don't have any sense. You can press predestination with pre-knowledge. I like what Tracy said to me earlier. She said, if God knows everyone that's going to accept him and believe, but he goes ahead and creates them anyway, and the ones that wouldn't believe, he goes ahead and creates them anyway. He knows who won't believe in him, but he creates them anyway. No, that's not the way it is. The Bible says, whether you like this or not, for whom he did foreknow, whom, whose, is masculine and gender plural. There's a bunch of whom's, whose. You don't know nothing about the Greek language, whose. Whom he did foreknow, prognosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. He did not know everybody beforehand. Pro means before. Gnosko means to know beforehand. He's going to say the ones on the left hand in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. He's, he's going, he says on later in that chapter, he says, Depart from me that work iniquity. I never knew you. I never gnosko you. So the people, masculine and gender, plural, plural, all those that he foreknew, he predestined. And it's not the word predestinate, it's the word pro horizo. That's the word in the Greek. This is the Bible was written, the New Testament was written in the Greek 2,000 years ago. That's the word. It means before horizo. Horizo is the verb form of horizon. It means to predetermine for the horizon, for the light. And the ones he foreknew, he predestined them for the light, and he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none righteous, not one. If God didn't pick himself out of family and preordain them for eternal life and that they will walk righteously and conform to Christ's likeness, likeness, he's predestined us to be conformed to his image. Icon means likeness. He'll put you through fire and trials and persecution till he causes you to walk righteously. You're just very ignorant. You want to just throw out the, the New Testament. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. Be with Holy and without blame is what he's predestined us to, or chosen us to. Before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption, huiothesia, H-U-I-O-T-H-E-S-I-A, it comes from huios, H-U-I-O-S, and tithame. Tithame means to place, and huios is sons. You go to an orphanage, and the, you don't, the, the child doesn't pick you out. You pick out the one you want, and that's what God did. He's got all these people in the universe and he said this one's mine this one's mine and this one's mine and the rest of them are going to hell if we all went to hell that would be fair but it's grace charis that he chose us you had, whoever you are mister you don't know nothing about the bible zero much less the greek language just dumb you can you confuse predestined with pre-knowledge you are just arrogant you just Throw out the meaning of the Bible. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. You didn't mention one Bible verse in here. Not one. I'm going to read the rest of this goofy letter. He said, just because he knows who will be in heaven, he doesn't know who will be in heaven. He ordained who will be there. 
and don't mean he made it that way yes it does it means exactly that you just you have an opinion that then wouldn't mount to a hill of beans if i hold a dollar in one hand a hundred in the other and take and say one and say take one i know you'll take the hundred no i won't not the way you talk it's probably got poison on it so when i can take hold of it it'll kill me but it doesn't mean I made you to do it. You got stupid reasoning, dumb. You don't even pay any attention to these words. What God said in His book. It seems to me you pick what you want to to truth or not. You hadn't said one word of truth in your email. Not one Bible verse. Not one Greek word. You don't have any sense. If we are predestined, then why are you preaching? I love the Lord with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to be a part. I go out here, I know that that most of the world is going to hell because God ordained them for it. Many are going into Broadway, and I want to be a part of getting the message to those few elect. I love God, and I preach His Word because I love Him, not for much to win anybody. I love this book with all my heart if we're predestined then why are you preaching I just told you the method of getting God's people will be the preaching of the word how shall they hear without a preacher you can't bring anyone to God you are so dumb and so ignorant you're just an idiot to write this kind of email you're stupid unless you change if you don't change, you'll probably die and go to hell one day. They're going to get there with or without you. No, they're going to get there with me. There's no purpose in what you're doing. Thank you very much. I'll call you if I need to go to the grocery store and buy some bread and milk, okay? I'll call you and, and ask you if I need to fix my car. I got a flat tire. Uh, what a dumb guy this is. This man is stupid. You you don't have one thing about the Bible in here. Not one thing. And then I got the high Calvinist. I commented on reformers. Calvinists do not fully believe in predestination and the sovereignty of God. God is not the author of sin. He certainly is. <laughs> oh, who do you think? Built, made that tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Who made that? Who came up with the idea of a law? That was God's idea. Who made Adam out of corrupt dust and said, Thou shalt not, and the day you eat, you will die? It's just people write me stupid things. Sin proceeds from the totally depraved hearts of men. I agree with that. But they're depraved because God made them that way. And he picks out the ones he wants and puts truth and faith in their heart. Did God decree, did God decree sin? Yes. <laughs> You're really funny. God made sin. However, sin does not proceed from God. It certainly does. It proceeds from the fact that he made the tree and he says, Thou shalt not and you can't keep from partaking of it, Adam. The day you eat, you will die. I didn't say if you eat. You just, all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that's righteous. There's none that seeks after God. Well, I got one more, and he kind of likes me. Snowman commented on the ten plagues. God kills. God makes his people sick because of sin. Pastor Jim, I never tire of your messages when you remind me that God is actually God. He is God of everything. That's in opposition to what these two I just read. Nothing is outside of his control or power. Even the lightning bolts, as you remind us, report to him, amen. My little girl lay in the hospital now, and this message reminds me that he is God of the hospital. He wanted my little one there. He has recaptured my attention after I focused on earthly vanity be sure 
He is God of admission, stay, and discharge. He is God of gods, as King Nebuchadnezzar learned. He gives and he takes away. He wounds, he heals, and he puts down and he raises up. Indeed, let everything that hath breath praise him. Amen. Thank you for that. Snowman, keep writing to me. I'll keep reading your emails. Thank you so much. I... People say, you shouldn't be this hard on people. You write me something stupid, I'm going to tell people it's stupid. If you don't know what you're talking about, don't write and expect me not to read it, because I will. And I will comment on how dumb I think it is. It's like it's like a, a, a four-year-old that can hardly read and you say, the square root of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of square roots of both sides. And you say, well, I, and the little kid says, I don't know if I believe that. I want some ice cream and candy. Well, that's what you're talking like, some little kid that knows nothing about trigonometry. That's the Pythagorean theorem. You could say, I don't know what the Pythagorean theorem means. Well, that don't mean it's not true. It's just crazy the comments that people will make. Write to me and say dumb things. You don't even know you're being that dumb, but you are. You need to get your concordance and look words up. I got a few announcements to make. We've got a picnic coming up on May the 18th. Everybody come and join us. Lunch will be served at approximately 1130. We'll be down here at Moss Wright Park on the edge of Goodless Village, right next door to Hendersonville. It's not any further than the park that we've been meeting in, but the tornado come through town and wiped that park out. And uh, we'll meet here early that morning. You can come here to the church. And uh, that'll be May 18th, 2024, Moss Wright Park. We'll have pizza, pepperoni, sausage, veggie, ham, pineapple, and cheese. And a pasta bar. Sweet Italian sausage, pasta, Cajun chicken, pasta, breads, and desert, uh, desserts. I started to say deserts. Desserts, water, soda, and coffee. You are welcome to bring your favorite snacks and desserts, but it is not required. Please join us for food and fellowship. That's It's on the door back there. Come to the church first, about probably about 9 o'clock, and we'll all go down there together, like Billy Joel said. We'll all go down together. <laughs> all right. Uh, we give away a lot of, we give away about twenty six, twenty eight hundred dollars $2,800 a month to the needy. We got people like the lady in, uh, in Australia, we send her $300 a month. She's got cancer and we send money to, uh, Robin Peters down in Amarillo, Texas. She's got leukemia. She's coming up here for the picnic. And then I'm hoping that Danielle will come for the picnic. She's down in Louisiana. She's the paraplegic. A lot of people probably wonder why we hadn't bought that van for her. The money is in the bank. We got enough people that volunteered money, but she's been very sick. We got some pictures of her where she's got great big holes on her legs and it go down to the bone. I mean, that big. And in her arms. And I don't know what that is. I had one lady write and said she studied that in nursing and uh, said it was some kind of a ulcer that eats away at your skin down to the bone. And that's what she's got. And uh, Daniela's sweet lady. She loves this truth. She writes to us and tells us, we love you, Daniela. I, I hope you can get well enough to take that government program so we can buy you that van. And uh, 
just we encourage you to do the best you can. She said if she doesn't feel good, she'll call me and let me know that she won't be able to come. But we're going to keep the money in the bank for her until she she goes through this government program. The government will pay half of the van. And uh, in other words, the van will be about 85000 They'll pay about forty-five. So we'll have forty-five or so left to give to Danielle like a month at a time over a year, two-year period. And uh, we just really want to help her. We got people all over the country that we send money to. We only give money to people who believe the truth and they, they love this word and they have a debilitating disease of some kind or they're real poor, going through a real bad struggle, not making enough money to live on. And we've sent several people 300 a month, and then we send uh, uh, some people 50 a month, 100 a month, depending on their particular situation. But uh, we love the we love the people that support this ministry. If you want to send money to the needy, make your check to Grace and Truth Ministries and put on the bottom, on the notice on the bottom, so much amount for tithe or offering and so much to the needy. And we will put that in the benevolent fund. I never mix the benevolent fund with the operational funds, never. I've got a building fund that is separate from the benevolent fund. Benevolent fund is for needy people only. I've got a check book just for the benevolent fund as well as a checkbook for the operational uh, procedures. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for truth. God, give me the message tonight that you'd have me have to reach out to these people, and God will, will trust you for it. God, help me to say the things that need to be said that will challenge the people here and we'll give you praise for everything. Fight our battles. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right. just found out that Lily was in a car accident. What did you say? Lily was in a car accident. She's at Vanderbilt. Who is? Lily. Lily? Yeah. Oh, she just got she just got to Vanderbilt. No, I don't know. He didn't say when it was at. He just let everybody know when he checked it. Okay, on John. On did. John. Yeah. Uh, Lily was in a car accident and she's at Vanderbilt. Lily Judd. They just got the message on the internet. She's at Vanderbilt. You know how serious? Was it serious? Do you know? It just said that she had some broken bones. Huh?
Lily is a, really a dear lady. She's just so simple and quiet and just laid back and just, she's one of the uncomely parts of the body of Christ. She's not outgoing and not flashy and she's just a simple lady that dresses in simple print dresses and just sits back and listens and enjoys the message. We love you, Lily. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. We live stream every Wednesday night at at 6.30 and 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. That's Central Standard Time here in America. I say that because people are watching from around the world. And uh, I'm trying to tell you, teach to you, about the mark of the beast and the seal of God. They're exact opposites. They're in opposition to one another. This, the mark of the beast is the word. The mark is karagma. C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. The mark of the beast has always been here. It's been here since the garden because there was a beast in the garden. That was the serpent. A beast... The serpent, and the serpent, actually, God created the, he created sin in the garden, so it would have the beast, anything that opposed God would be according to uh, the law of God that says, thou shalt not eat of that tree in the garden. And eating of the tree takes deception. And that's exactly what the serpent did. And he did it by the meaning of his name or his, the word serpent is the word nakash, N-A-C-H-A-S-H, nakash. And it means to enchant or to whisper, enchant or whisper. It means to say soft words that appeal to the ear. And this word karagma means it has to do with the character. It tells you it comes from the word C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-R. When you look up the word C-H-A-R-A-C-T-E-R, which is our word character, in Webster's Dictionary, it will tell you the ancient word is C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-R. And he tells you, they will tell you that that means in, in the, uh, the character is the distinctive quality of uh, the person. Distinctive quality. And the quality of Satan and his emissaries is deception or deceiving. 
Let me read to you something I wrote on deceiving and deception or this this distinctive quality of the beast. I wrote this because I studied it and thought about it. That's the distinctive quality of the beast. The beast is... The distinctive quality of the beast is actually the character of the beast, and it is a deception. Nothing in the Bible is more evil than deception. What's going on, I believe the mark of the beast is here right now. It's deceiving the world. There's a haze over the world. There's a haze coming from the pulpits, and the preachers are preaching and the deception is the easy, easy Jesus. The one they preach in the Baptist pulpits that says, walk down the aisle and accept Christ as your Savior. When you cannot accept Christ, I was telling somebody last night on the phone, I said, you cannot accept Christ. When I was walking into uh, my hearing aid place, and I was walked in, and I had on a shirt that said, uh, I'm waiting for Jesus to come back and get me out of this insane world. And right under that, it said, Preachers and politicians are lying. And a lady sitting there, maybe in her mid-60s, she said, What do you mean preachers are lying? I said, That's a good question. Thank you very much. And I said... And I started in, I said, they're talking about a sinner's prayer for salvation. The Bible says that's not true. That's easy to pray a prayer and say, I'm going to get to go to heaven because I prayed a prayer. That's an easy Jesus. That's an easy gospel. That's an easy gospel. And then I said, well, I said, the Bible says that the natural man, natural sukikos, that's his physical man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Their foolishness is him. And I said that word receive is the word dekomai. Preachers are not telling people this. D-E-C-H-O-M-A-I. I said dekomai comes from the word dek. I said you'll recognize this. A decade is ten years. Deck is the word ten in the Greek. And I said, Dekomai means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been given, been presented, and all the Baptist churches in America are preaching, accept Christ as your personal Savior and walk down the aisle. That's easy. That's a breeze. Anybody can do that. Anybody can walk down the aisle and pray a prayer and say, I'm home free. And I said, you cannot accept Christ. And I said, when you're dead, you're dead in sin. I told her that. I was gentler than I am with y'all right now. I just said, you're dead in sin. And I said, and all the Baptist preachers in America preach, they preach the sinner's prayer for salvation. And they use Romans ten thirteen. That's an easy Jesus. They say all you have to do is walk down the aisle and pray this prayer. And Romans ten thirteen says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But I said, have you ever read the next verse? It says, How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? I said, Belief is the method of salvation. And if you believe Jesus, it's a verb, you'll do what he says. I said, There is no sinner's prayer for salvation. That is wrong. Every Baptist, and I've told her, every Baptist preacher in America, including my father, preached that. It's wrong. That's easy. That's the deception. That's what deceives people in easy gospel. I also told her about tongues. I said, there's two words for tongue in the Bible. There's no such thing as Pentecostal tongues. No such thing. I said, the two words are glossa and dialectos. Glossa. It is easy to make up some and dialect us, D-I-A-L-E-K-T-O-S. I said, what's easy is not to find those words and go into some Pentecostal church and go, Shanda Lamanda Kanda, Shanda Monda Sika Makalaka, and say you're talking in tongues. That's a bunch of dribble and garbage. And by that time, I started telling her about predestination. I said, no preachers believe in predestination hardly anywhere. 
And I said, the Bible teaches about that time she was called in to, for examination. I was going to tell her about that. She wanted to know where preachers are lying. I'm going to have me a T-shirt made up that says, Preachers are lying on the front and the back. I'll get some answer. I'll get some questions there, but you better be ready to answer the people when you say that to them. That will get, that will probably get more questions than anything I've ever said on a t-shirt. Preachers are lying. Just say that to somebody. They'll go, whoa, what are you talking about? Boy, they're going to open the door for me when they say that because I get real gentle but firm with them. I am sick of the preachers talking about act. The man who started that more than anything else is Billy Graham. He had people walk the aisle to accept Christ. He had people walk in the aisle to pray the sinner's prayer. And it's just not true. When you're dead in sin, I love the verse in Isaiah 64 and 7. There's none. Isaiah 64 and 7 says there is none that calls upon thy name. Notice calls upon thy name precedes wakens himself up that calls upon thy name then notice calling comes before the last part of this there's none that calls upon thy name that stirs himself up to take hold of thee stir up is the word uwr it means to wake oneself from the dead. That's exactly what the Baptist preachers are saying. They're saying all you have to do is walk down the aisle and pray this prayer and and you wake yourself up from the dead. That's what they're saying. The Bible says that's not true in the book of Isaiah. Good grief. My father kept telling me I had to accept Christ and kept preaching these scary messages, death threat messages, and the end is going to come and you may go die and go to hell, Jimmy. And I kept walking the aisle and he kept baptizing me in water and kept walking the aisle and dipping me in water. And I knew I just felt nothing but wet. It's wrong. Baptize in every Baptist, in every church of Christ, in every Pentecostal want to dip people in water and that's not the meaning of the word baptize just amazes me I can find out what baptize means and nobody else can find it out it's crazy I got a paper over here right here you can look up in McClinic and Strong baptism by blood and it's got a section baptism by blood and then it says, metaphorical use. The Christian church illusion is very early made to a baptism by blood in connection with martyrdom. This is out of McClinic and Strong. You can get that on the internet. Baptism by blood. Water baptism, isn't that easy? Isn't that what it is? Just walk down the aisle, pray the prayer. I say, I accept Christ and get dipped in water and whew, you're gone. You're home for it. That's not true. Not true. I'll say it one more time. Baptize is the word baptizo in the Greek. Mr. Robert Baker Girdlestone, G-I-R-D-L-E-S-T-O-N-E. A great scholar has a book, Old Testament, Greek words. And he's got a, and you've also got Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and you've got McClintock and Strong, which is the same Strong that produced the Strong's Concordance. And you go into Strong's McClintock and Strong, get the B volume, look up baptism. He will tell you right off, first paragraph. He says, baptize is not a verb implying motion, not a verb. A verb is an action. Action verbs show motion. He said it is not a verb implying motion, not. He said it is a, it is a verbal 
noun. I know from English that a verbal noun is called an infinitive. Infinitive, we get the word infinite, infinite from that. Once, you're, once it happens to you, it takes for the rest of your life. An infinitive is where there's a man here. And from an, the movement is only on the part of the fluid, not on the part of the person being baptized. There has to be a fluid coming from an outer source. That's God. It's the blood of Christ. That's the fluid. And it has to come upon the man from God and baptize him all over. And that's a martyrdom. And that's why Jesus said in Mark 10, Mark 10, 10. He tells James and John, can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? He's not saying, can we back up three and a half years and can you be dipped in water? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die the death tomorrow. The martyr's death. Can you? He said, both of them said, yes, we can. He said, both of you will die the death. The amazing thing about that, John wrote the book of Revelation later on, about 96 AD. And nearly every scholar you run across says, we don't know whether John died in the martyr or not. Jesus said he would. That's the amazing thing. People don't even pay any attention to what the Bible says. If Jesus said it, it's true. After he was boiled in oil and put on Patmos, he come off and then he must have been martyred because Jesus said he would. The, the, water baptism is easy, isn't it? That's what that is. Is 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. Some will come to Corinth, Paul said, and they're preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel that I have not preached. He said, I'm afraid you'll bear with those guys preaching this, accept Jesus, accept Christ, give your heart to Christ. You can't give your heart to Christ. Your heart is filthy and dirty. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Why does he want your dirty, filthy heart? He has to take your heart away and give you a heart of flesh. But he does the giving. You don't. You don't have anything to do with it. You have to believe, but you can't because there's none that seeketh after God. Nobody seeks God. I'm trying to tell you about it's God that seals his people. He, when he seals us, he seals us with the Holy Spirit. But it's really easy. What is the Holy Spirit? That's the, every time you see the Spirit, the Spirit in the New Testament, the Spirit, when it says something about the Spirit, it's talking about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Ghost is the same word as spirit. It's the word P-N-E-U-M-A. I don't know why the translators put ghost one place and spirit another. They're the same word. Because those scholars that translated, they made some mistakes. Now, I'm talking about sealing with the spirit. Let me show you something. Look here in Ephesians 1 and verse 13. Speaking of Christ, let's read 11, 12, and 13. Speaking of Christ, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He does it because he wants to. That we should be to the praise of the glory who hath first trusted in Christ, in whom, speaking of Christ, ye have trusted after that we were, we, after you heard the word of truth. Now we got to, I'm going to tell you about the truth. The Bible says in 1 John 5 and 6 that the Spirit is the truth. 
So the Holy Spirit, every time you find it, you can substitute, substitute truth. Holy Spirit is the truth. And let me give you the definition of truth one more time. When, you, when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, this is what it does. We're sealed. The word sealed it's a very interesting word. It's something they used constantly in the ancient world. Sealed. Seal or sealed. Either one of them. There is the word sphragis, S-P-H-R-A-G-I-S. That's the noun. S-P-H-R-A-G-I-Z-O. That's the verb form of the same word. A noun is a thing, the verb, a noun is a person, place, or thing. You learn that in about the fifth grade or something like that. It's a person, place, or thing. A verb shows action. So, sfragizo means signature. Signature shows ownership. So when God seals us, with the Holy Spirit, it shows He owns us. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. He owns us. And He seals all of His people. And He marks all those to destruction with His character, with the character of Satan. He marks them with Satan's character. I was going to read you the... I was going to read you this uh, distinct quality. Let me read that to you before I go any further. This is something I wrote out. A distinct quality. Distinct quality is the distinctive quality of the character, the mark of the beast is deception. Deception is fooling people, making them feel good by causing them to think you are telling them truth while you are lying. That's called a con man. While they are lying to them by making them feel good about the con, and you are putting on them, promising them the moon, while stealing them blind and giving them nothing. That's what a deception does it steals from you while you're not looking and you don't think nothing's wrong you ever been conned i've been conned i've been conned many times in my life in the music business there's all kinds of confidence man con comes from the word confidence they get your confidence let's read the rest of that verse that you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit, the truth of promise. Every time you find Holy Spirit, you can substitute truth. If equals are substituted for equals, the results are equal. The Holy Spirit equals truth. And the whole how he seals us he causes us to be able to define this word truth. The word truth is aletheia, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. Aletheia is the, is the word truth, and it comes from lanthano. I put this on the board a thousand times, I guess. Lanthano, it, this is the construction of truth. Lanthano means to lie hid or to conceal, or to hide something. Conceal. And the alpha privative, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, as an alpha privative. Alpha, anytime you have alpha privative, it means it negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. Alanthano means not to hide anything. That's the word truth. So we're sealed with the fact that we don't hide anything and we can see the truth in everything, in the Bible especially. Now, I'm going to tell you some things about the truth. The Bible says 
In 1 John 5 and 6, the Spirit is the truth. In first in John 17 and 17, the Bible says, Thy word is truth. So the word of God, he seals us with the word of God in our hearts. Where is the word of God? It's in our hearts. Let me erase this up here. So if the, if the, the, if the word is truth, John 17, 17, the Holy Spirit is truth equals truth. The Word of God equals truth. Everywhere you find something, you can substitute truth every time you find Word, every time you find Holy Spirit. You can substitute truth because they're equal. Things equal to the same thing or equal to each other. So the Holy Spirit is the Word of God where He writes it in our hearts. He writes His Word in our hearts. He writes the Word of God there in Second Corinthians, the third chapter. The Word is shed abroad in our hearts. He said the same thing in Romans, the fifth chapter. He said, sheds His Word in our heart, sheds the Spirit in our heart. So when you see the Spirit, let me tell you some other things about this. When you go over to Hebrews, the I want to show you how you connect some of these things. You go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 20. We enter into the Holy of Holies by a new and living way. The Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament, there was a temple. In the New Testament, you are the temple. You are, we are, no, you're not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which temple you are. So he says, we are the temple. The temple is us. Let me just put us up there. Us. So we are this temple. And we enter into the Holy of Holies by a new and living way. That is to say, we enter into the veil of the temple, V-I-L, by a new and living way through the veil, that is to say. When you see that is to say, it's the same thing as saying, I-E, I-D, E-S-T, that's a Latin term that means the veil is the same thing as the flesh. But when it says the flesh, it doesn't say T-H-E. It says it is tau eta, feminine. It's the feminine flesh of Christ. And we're going to learn through this that the feminine flesh is the body of <clears throat> the church. The church is the wife, the bride of Christ. Wife or bride. So the temp this veil of the temple spiritually is the church, which is feminine. It's feminine. And this inner sanctuary was called the house of God by the Jews because that's where he came in and lived and sat upon the top of the Ark of the Covenant and ruled Israel from there. That's the house of God. Well, this inner sanctuary, the Bible says in the New Testament, Christ is a son of his own house. Whose house are we? We're the house of God. So the same thing in here is us, and the law is written on tables of stone and kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now the law is written on fleshy tables of our heart and written... Written has to do with a choragma. That is a that is a that is connected to the word graphe, which means writing. It's a graph in our language. It means writing. So this 
we live in, we go into a new and living way through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So if the veil is his flesh, let's go to something else. The veil is the flesh. That's going to lead us back to the truth, believe it or not. Now, let's go over here to, the, said, the Bible says in John 6, 51, that the bread that I give you is my flesh. So the bread is the flesh. So the bread would be the veil and the flesh. They're equal. And then you go to John 6, 53. He says, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And then he turns around and tells you what eat flesh and drink blood means. He says, my flesh is meat indeed. Indeed is the word alethes. Oops, wait a minute. It's, it's a form of aletheia, meaning of truth. It, it's alethes, A-L-E-T-H-E-S. Alethes means of truth. So, you can actually say, the veil is of truth. So the veil is the truth, is the bread, it's the flesh, it's the veil of truth. You can't be of truth without being the truth. So if it's of truth. He said, my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. A blood was the blood baptism. A blood baptism was a death. It was a martyrdom. So that's death to self, and that's the truth. Death to self happens in the narrow way. Narrow is the way but that's the gospel isn't it so the gospel is the narrow way the beginning of the gospel mark one and one mark one and one the beginning of the gospel is it was written by the prophets it is prepare you the way of the lord make his path straight way is the word hados and the beginning of the gospel is narrow is the way. The word narrow, thalibo, thalibo, it comes from the word thalipsis. Thalipsis is the noun, thalibo is the verb, and thalipsis, G-H-L-I-P-L-I-P-S-I-S. Thalipsis is the word tribulation. So tribulation is the truth, it's the narrow way, it's the gospel, and the way into the holiest is the way into the holiest is through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Well, therefore, the gospel in the narrow way would be the same thing as truth. Notice all these words come together. They're all a part of the same picture. God gave us a whole bunch of different words. Let me give you a couple of more of these. He says here in John 6, in Colossians 1.13, look at this. Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. Every time you find the flesh... The is usually always feminine gender. It doesn't mean Christ was female in the flesh. It means the church, is, the church was his body. It was his wife, his bride. Every time you find, you find the spirit or the flesh, I've, every time I've looked it up, it's feminine gender. That means the church, the wife, the bride of Christ. You have to learn to look up the word the. We've got it on this chart over here. I've got it on this. <clears throat> every time you find the, it'll be one of these words here. Right here. 
This is the, every time the word the is mentioned in the New Testament, it'll either be ma masculine and gender, feminine, neuter, in the singular, masculine, and feminine, neuter, in the plural. Every time you find the, it's either hey, feminine gender, tase, feminine gender, tay, feminine gender, or tain, feminine gender. Every time you find it, every time I've looked it up, it's one of these, feminine gender, that has to be the wife, the bride of Christ. It cannot be Jesus because he's not a female. The body, the flesh, and the flesh that we eat of is the church. Can you see that? That's the whole thing. Now let me give you some more of these. And we see here, the, here in Colossians. Let's go over Colossians. Colossians. You, you can get a... You can get a... Uh, analytical lexicon and it'll have if you don't have this chart I'll be glad to give you this chart I've made copies of it and I'll give you one but you can look up hey you can look up hey here hey this is it right here anytime a word ends with that it's feminine gender or if it has hey uh, in a to a to n, it's feminine gender. You can look in a analytical lexicon if you don't have this chart. And you look it up alphabetically: alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, ilta, capital, lambda, mu, nu, and so forth. You get to the eta, and it'll, you, if you look it up alphabetically, it'll tell you it's feminine gender every time. Or tain, or taste. Always right on the end of a word, Ada is always feminine. Has to be talking about the church, the wife, that's feminine, the bride, that's feminine. Then let's look here in Colossians. Colossians, the, the uh, first chapter, verse, verse 13. And he is, verse, Colossians, Colossians 1 and 17, not 13, 1, 17. And he is before all things, all things, by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the hay church. Feminine gender, who is, the, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So the body is the church, the wife, the bride of Christ. You always got to think about the before. And when it says the body or the flesh, it's talking about feminine gender. So it's talking about the church. Look down here in verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet hath he quickened. And in the body of, it doesn't say his flesh in the original text. It says the flesh, feminine gender. It says taste, tau, eta, sigma. There it is over there. Right there. Feminine gender. Tied to sigma. That's what it is. You can look at it in your in your interlinear Bible, and when you see one of these words right before it, you'll know it's feminine gender. Look in your interlinear. Every time you see thee, every time it says his flesh, it never talks about that. It's talking about the feminine flesh of Christ, which is the church. Can you see that? That's pretty simple. And then he goes on to say, down here in, so let me read that again. In the body of the flesh, feminine gender, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And then in verse 24, 
who had who now rejoice in my offerings for you and fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ in my flesh says the flesh feminine gender and the flesh for his body's sake which is the church the body is the church the church the body is the flesh the flesh is the bread the bread is the all of it is the same so when you learn to match these things up, and they're all the same, it's just different ways to put it. You look at your inner linear Bible and you'll see whether it's feminine gender or whatever. And then let's go to the next one. <clears throat> and look over here in in first John. First John. I've given you this before, but I like giving it to you so you can see it. Because a lot of people don't know what this means. It sounds like in English it's saying something it doesn't say. It sounds like it. Let's read this here together. Beloved, believe not every spirit. The chapter 4, verse 1. Believe not every spirit, but try. It don't mean try on like try on a piece of clothing. The word is dokimazo, D-O-K-I-M-A-Z-O. Put in the fire and see if it stands the test, D-O-K-I-M-A-Z-O. Dokimas means to try or put in the fire. Adokimas, A-D-O-K-I-M-A-S means no fire. And that's the word reprobate. Reprobate silver is a type of silver that had not been put in the fire. So we have to go through the fire to prove who we are. So he said, try the spirits. If it's, whether it be of God, because many false prophets are going out in the world. Hereby, here's how we know the Spirit. Or well, let me put it this way. Let's substitute truth there, okay? Can we substitute truth for Spirit since, since the Spirit is the truth? Can we substitute truth there? Here's how we know the truth of God in a man. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. That sounds like if a Hindu says Jesus came in a human body, that sounds like that's what it's talking about, isn't it? But that's not what it's talking about. That word flesh is the word sarki, S-A-R-K-I. It's a form of sarks, S-A-R-K-I. It's a form of S-A-R-X, which is the word flesh, and S-A-R-K-I is feminine gender. So when he says, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is come in the feminine flesh, every spirit that says, I'm confessing that Christ has come in my flesh by agreeing with him. But confess doesn't mean simply to say with the mouth. Confess is the word homologeo. It means to be of the same homo. A homosexual is of the same sex. Homogenized comes from that. Anything with homo on it means of the same. Logos. Of the same logos. It means to agree with. If you confess Christ, you don't just walk down some aisle in some church. That's an easy Jesus. That's an easy mark of the beast. If the beast can get everybody conned into believing, I can walk down the aisle and say, uh, I'd like to accept Christ and I want to pray that prayer. Okay, I'm home free. No, you're not. See, Confess doesn't just mean to say with the mouth. Titus 1.16 says so. Look at Titus 1.16. Titus 1, Timothy, Titus, 
Titus 1.16 says, Some men profess that they know God. The problem is, profess is the exact same word as confess. Profess is the word homologeo. Most people don't know that. Profess is that word right there, confess. He said, some men confess that they know God, but what they do, they deny him. But in works, they deny him. People say, works don't have anything to do with this. Yes, it does. And it has everything to do. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we walk in the good works of God. The good works is agathos. I've had people say, Jim is preaching salvation by works. I am not. I'm preaching salvation that works. If you're not saved by salvation that works, it is Christ that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. He comes into your heart, puts you through fire and trials and persecution and tribulation over years time, over 10, 15 years till he breaks you and calls you to be willing to walk righteously before him. He had to do that to me because I wanted to be a famous singer. I was out there running around the country singing in clubs and singing in gospel music and it was all heathenism until he broke me. He broke me from that. I found out and I wanted to be proud and lifted up. I wanted that easy Jesus for a long time. I wanted a Jesus that didn't make me behave myself. He'll make you behave and you will walk righteously and you will conform to the image of Christ. He says, some men profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Deny is the way to A-R-A-R-N-E-O-M-A-I. Or nail my means to contradict. You contradict Christ by what? You do. Doing. But you, you mean we have to do the works of Christ? Yes. What is the works of Christ? What did Jesus tell the apostles in John 6? They said, well, you want us to do works? What are the works that we have to do? Listen, listen to this. I love this, this verse. It has been a real... It has been a real convicting thing to me. In John 6, the apostles come to Jesus and they say to him, what are the works that we have to do? He says in verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat <coughs> which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him hath the Father sealed. And the, they said unto Jesus, what shall we do? Notice they said, we want to know what do we do? And Jesus didn't tell them they didn't have to do anything. He didn't say that. What do we do that we might, that we might work the works of God? What do we do? And he tells them what it is. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. That's God's work. What is believe? Believe is the word pistis. It's a verb. Verbs are what you work at, what you do. You don't work for salvation. You work because you are His and because He requires it of His children. He's going to conform us to His image, His likeness. That's what we're predestined to. We're going to be without blame and holy before Him in love. That's what He's chosen us to in Ephesians 1 and 4. He's chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. Holy means we're going to live right Righteously. Holy is the word hagios, H-A-G-I-O-S. 
And it's, the verb form of that is hagiazo, H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. And that word is the word sanctify. God sanctifies us by setting us apart. He sets us apart for his work. Hagios is the word holy. It means to be pure or single. What God does, he puts us in the fire. You put gold in the fire and you turn the heat up to the heavens and it'll burn out all the lesser metals. It'll burn out zinc and copper. Even silver will burn out and all that will be left is gold. And gold, the hotter you get it, it'll become liquid and it will mold anything God wants it to mold to. That's what it's about. It's about God turning up the heat in our lives. Don't ever gripe about the trials that you're in because that's what God's got you in to mold you to his will. It's it's really kind of a scary thing. I love this verse when he says, this is the work of God that you believe. Believe is doing. It's doing... You mean we have to do the will of God? Yes. He that doeth, there in First John, the third chapter, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. He that doeth dikaya o sune. D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. Dikaya o sune is a form of D-I-K-E. And D-K, which is the stem of that word is the word right you can say i don't know what righteousness is righteous is well do you know what right is everybody knows what right is and what wrong is don't you you have to do right he that doeth i love that in john three twenty one. he that doeth truth everything that truth is He that doeth the Holy Spirit, that's the truth. He that doeth the word of God, he that doeth truth cometh to the light, cometh to the horizon. And we're predestined pro horizo. We're predetermined for the horizon by all the trials that God puts us through. People that don't believe in predestination are ignorant. You cannot study the Bible without believing in it. Then he says here, We have to, just because you confess that you know Christ, what you are at home should be what you are out in public. There's one person, there's some people that know who you are. Your spouse and your kids. If you have any kids, they know you. If they see you misbehave or cuss a little, they're going to do the same thing. So, confessing is doing. He that doeth truth cometh to light. Believe not every spirit. Let's go back over there to 1 John. To 1 John. I love that verse. And when he's talking about how you can tell what the truth is in a man or not. It's if he, if he is a part of the church, the wife, the bride of Christ, he'll be doing the truth. When he says, Hereby know you the Spirit of God, verse 2, every spirit that confesseth. Confess is, do, is doing. It's, it, it always, you can write out by the side of that Titus 1.16. Some men profess that they know God, but in worse they deny him. What you do to, is the sign of God, it's the signature of God on you because he seals us with the Holy Spirit. He puts his signature on us. That's his signature on our life. That's his seal. Seals were official. They would tell you who something belonged to and so would the mark, the stamp. They would tell you who something, something belonged to. If you do the truth, you'll know, you'll come to the light, you'll do righteousness. And this is the work of God that we believe. That's God's work in us. And Jesus told the apostles in John 4, 32 to 34, he said, 
they went into town. Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. And they come back out of town. They were bringing some food for Jesus. And they said, have you eaten anything? He said, I have a meat to eat of that you don't know anything about. And my meat that I, I don't put it in my mouth, my meat is to do the will of the Father. It's doing. How do you do the will of the Father? You read your Bible, you study it, you say the truth to people. That's, that's believing God, saying the truth and being what he says. Be kind and tender and gentle-hearted, but be real firm. I tell people, don't beat people up when you go out in public. Just tell them the truth. That's the work of God. But it takes a lot of work to learn them the truth now. I'm going to show you some other things here. We are sealed by God's Spirit. But these guys that's preaching this easy gospel, this tongues thing, this faith healing, there's no such thing as faith healing. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. It's dumb. Because every one of those faith healers gets old and they get sick and they die. If you don't believe in, if you believe in faith healing, Kenneth Copeland, you shouldn't have to ever die. He says he's going to live to be 120. I doubt that very seriously. If you live that long, then you're going to die and go to hell because you're a false teacher and a liar and a cheat. Don't like that guy. Kenneth, uh, what gets me, I've said it a hundred times, Oral Roberts is the most famous faith healer that has been in the world in the last hundred years. And he died of pneumonia in a hospital out in, in California, in a rich section of California. He died of pneumonia. Why didn't he call Benny Hinn to heal him when he had pneumonia? Uh, Paul Crouch, who started TBN, he was up the street. You can go online and get all this information. How did Oral Roberts die? How did how did Paul Crouch die? And they'll tell you online. Paul Crouch wrestled with with congestive heart failure for the last ten years of his life. When he was first diagnosed with congestive heart failure, why did, maybe six months after his diagnosis, why didn't he call Benny Hinn to have him come in and heal him? That way he wouldn't have had to die. But he did, and his purple-haired wife died of a stroke connected with a heart attack. She's out there praying for people all the time to be healed. And why is it that Kenneth Hagin, who started the positive confession movement in America, and he got it from E.W. Kenyon, who went, to, who went overseas to India and brought it back and said, if you lay down on these these crystals that your body will be healed or you can just simply say it with your mouth and you'll be healed. Say, I get a Cadillac, I get a Cadillac, I get a Cadillac. And they call that calling things that be not as though they were. If I believed that, I would go over to India where they have a million people lying in the streets in Calcutta and I'd tell all of them, all you have to be is positive with your mouth and you'll all be driving new cars next week and you'll be well. They're lying crooks is what they are. Kenneth Copeland is a lying, lying, lying thief. I'm saying that's hard. I want him to know that. I hope you watch it, Kenneth Copeland. You're a lying crook. Where does the Bible say a man, a preacher is supposed to be worth a billion dollars? He says he's worth a billion dollars. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and he didn't have a place to lay his head. I don't like Kenneth Copeland. I believe he is a con man extraordinaire. He's a lying thief. He's going to go to hell. I, I do not believe he can preach all these lies that he preached for 40 years and go to heaven. I don't believe God has made him a vessel of mercy. I don't believe that at all. Anyway, I've got more things to say on these seals. I want, us to, I want to read some things to you about the seals. People don't realize, I want to read this paper to you. I've got a paper on seals. I got this. 
out of. When the Bible speaks of the seals of God all through Revelation, starting in that 13th chapter, it talks about the mark and the seals of God. It's in. You can look it up in the McLennan Strong. Look up seal, and it will tell you these things here. The seal, together with the staff, has been in the east from the earliest times. And it tells you places you can find it. They were, they were worn up on the bosom on a finger ring that was a seal ring that they had. In the right hand, Genesis 41 and 42, Esther 3 and 10 and 8, and 8 and 2, and Jeremiah 22 and 24. And the art of graving seals is an ancient one. You'll find that in Exodus 28 and 11. And then he goes on to say, The name of the wearer sometimes with a sentence from the Koran, and it's customary to give an impression it, instead of a signature. They used the seal instead of a signature. That was official. That means that was your seal, and you owned it. If you sealed up a book, which was a scroll, and you dipped it in wax or in some kind of clay and sealed it, it was against the law to break that seal if you were some official. You could get penalized. For this purpose, the seal is moistened with a kind of black ink. Among the Jews, the women carried seal rings. Eastern princes, under the dignity of minister or regent, by the delivery of the state seal or seal ring, in the later language of the Jews, the word kathom, C-H-A-T-H-A-M, meant a counter or a token, perhaps with a seal. The seal with the owner's name or some other device engraven upon it was usually employed to authenticate public or private documents or ownership. It shows who owned it. And he put his seal of truth on us or the seal of the Holy Spirit according to Ephesians, the first chapter. And he wrote it in our hearts. He don't have to look at a computer chip on our forehead or our hand. It's in our mind. And he knows what's in the minds of all his people. Seals for this purpose were made of burned clay or copper or silver or gold or precious stones set in metal. They were anciently used in the East. Sometimes the signet ring was used for this purpose in Genesis 38 and 18 and Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 30, looks like 37 and 10. It's a door if a door is to be sealed it was it was to first be fastened with some figment over which was placed a well packed clay to break a seal when the bible says Christ was the Christ was the only one worthy to open the seven seals he was the official representative of god there in the the end of the fourth chapter and of revelation in the first chapter of in the fifth chapter of revelation and then they go on to say the seal <clears throat> if a cylinder <clears throat> cylinders were seals they were round made out of either metal or made out of concrete or marble and if they were a cylinder made was rolled into moss clay hence Job says it is it is turned as clay to the seal in Job 38 and 14 the term sealed is sometimes used figuratively for that which is permanent in Isaiah 8 and 16 and for that which is to be legal, to be kept secret. It reminds me of where the, the mystery of God is the church and God reveals himself to whomsoever he will so it's kept secret from the world. He sealed us and nobody knows who his sealed are except us. 
and also the book or roll sealed with seven seals symbolize the plan of the divine of the divine government which is impenetrable to every creature the sa it was comprehended by the savior who is exalted to the throne of the universe and the seal of the living god on which is supposed to be engraven the name of Jehovah. He engraves his name upon our foreheads and upon our hearts. I said that from Deuteronomy, from Deuteronomy the sixth chapter, which was impressed upon the foreheads of the faithful, symbolized the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or the truth. Now let me show you something about seals in the Old Testament. This is a shadow of the New Testament. Look at, go over here and look at Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. Ezekiel 9. How much time do I have, Mike? 29. All right, maybe I can get through a lot of this. Ezekiel, I'm going to read a verse to you before I read in Ezekiel. It'll be in Ezekiel, the 12th chapter, before I read in Ezekiel 9. In Ezekiel, the 12th chapter, I believe it is. In the, in, the 12, in the 11th chapter, in the 25th verse. And this is Ezekiel speaking. Then spake I unto them, are the children of Israel in, in Ezekiel is over in Babylon. And these are rebellious Jews that have been carried away into captivity. And he says, Then I spake unto them, to these Jews in captivity in Babylon, of the captivity, all the things that the Lord had showed me, all the things that had been showed to Ezekiel was from chapter 1 through chapter 11. That's everything he showed to him. That's the wheel and the wheels in verse 1, which the Babylonian war church coming in. He showed him what was going to happen. That's why you can say those wheel and the wheel were the, were the Babylonian war chariots. We've gone through all of that. And the, when you see the, the whirlwinds, whirlwinds, when Ezekiel said, I saw whirlwinds come out of the north, the, the, those Babylonian war chariots, as they would turn on that dust, they would stir up a whirlwind. And all through the Bible, the Bible talks about the chariots being whirlwinds. So that shows you that that's not a bad, that's a good exegesis of that first chapter because he says that here. Now, Ezekiel is in Babylon and God is giving him instruction. According to the eighth chapter, it shows what Israel is doing. Let me erase some of this. Israel is having a sunrise service 600 years before Jesus is born, but they're not worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping the rising sun. And on the walls of the, of the temple and on the inside walls of the, the building, of the walls that surround the temple, they had all these walls surrounding the temple. You had the temple in here, and they had openings in the walls. There's one in the north here that Ezekiel went, in, went through. He's seeing all this in a vision. When he goes in, he sees. He's seeing it all in a vision. He, and when you look in this eighth chapter, because of what they're doing, God says, I'm going to show you the abomination that Israel is doing inside the temple of God and Ezekiel is over here in Babylon. And he is, he is, God is taking him in a vision over here to Israel and let him see what's going on in this temple. And you got the, you got the brazen sea here. You got the, the altar of, the altar where they offered the sacrifices. You had the veil of the temple. You had the, uh, altar of incense, the table of showbread, and the seven candlesticks, and the Ark of the Covenant. And, he, and Ezekiel is over here seeing what they're doing, and Ezekiel enters in by the north gate and sees on the sides of the walls 
these wild-looking animals that they've painted on the walls or embrace, embrace, in Boston, in however they embossed them into the walls. He's showing these wild, these crazy paganness that Israel is involved in. This has a lot of meaning because when you get over later in Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is painting, let me say this and see if you can understand this. Because of what they're doing over here in Israel, putting all these pagan pictures of animals on the wall and, and pagan pictures of animals on the side of the temple and all these 25 men standing in front of the temple worship, facing the east, worshiping the sun. They're having a sunrise service 600 years before Jesus is born. So none of these people are thinking about what's going to happen if we rebuild the temple. If, what if, if Nebuchadnezzar is really coming and he destroys it? Because they're not thinking about spiritual things at all. So Ezekiel, later on, he gives, when you get up to that 40th chapter, he starts describing the rebuilding of the temple. Because you've got to remember, He's, Israel is peg acting like a bunch of pagans and they're not keeping count of how the temple is built or anything else they're just thinking about worshipping these this pagan gods Baal in the Grove and Shemash and Molech and all these animals they got painted on the side of the walls so they're not thinking about rebuilding the temple so God gives Ezekiel when you get on down in the book He's giving him a blueprint of the temple. And he's painting it, but just when you start reading it, you're not going to understand it. When you start reading it, he, he talks about so many steps up to this level, and then you go so many steps up here, and you got this urn and this, this thing over here. You're not going to understand all of it. What he's doing, he's making out a blueprint so that when they come back later on, this is around 593 B.C., when he's seeing this vision here. When you get down to uh, 586 B.C., that's when Nebuchadnezzar comes in destroys the temple, wipes it out, just crosses it out, and not until 538, when the Persian Empire is ruling, Persian Empire is ruling, that's when, that's when Cyrus gives a decree to rebuild the temple in 537 B.C., or oh, in 537, 538 B.C., right about there. Well, Cyrus is given, he's given the Israelites power to go rebuild the temple, but they don't have any blueprints. The only blueprint they have is what Ezekiel laid down in the book of Ezekiel. They don't have any blueprints. When you try to read, when you try to read that part of Ezekiel, you're going to go, what is this talking about? It's not for you, it's for the people that's going to rebuild the temple. It was destroyed when they weren't interested in the temple. If you go over there to the 30, to the 40th chapter, and he'll start talking about building something to this level and then building something to this level and, and putting a table in over here and, a, and an offering over here and this and that. And it goes into real complex things. He's writing down a blueprint for the people who are going to build it in 538 B.C. That's what he's doing. He's retaining that. But let's back up here to chapter 8. And he's seeing all this stuff here in the temple that they're doing. God says, let me show you what they're doing. I've read this before. In verse, eight, verse 9, he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they, they is talking about the Israelites. 
the wicked abominations that the Israelites are doing. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing, an abominable beast, and all the idols in the house of the Lord, in this righteous place of God. They had all these paganism going on in there. Israel, this is not talking about people in Moab or Ammon or Egypt. This is talking about Israelites. Then he says, And all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. They've got them portrayed upon the wall surrounding the temple. They may have had them on the temple. Other than the fact that this was mostly a tent. So they had them all inside here, had pictures of these pagan beasts that they, they were worshiping. I hope you can understand. He's talking to Israelites. And there stood before them 70 men of the servants of the house of Israel. In the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand. And a thick cloud of incense went up, and they're burning incense to the pagan gods. Israel is doing this. Do you understand that? That's not pagans doing it. Israel. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel, what these old priests are doing from Israel, what they're doing, what they do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery, and they say, The Lord seeth us not. God doesn't know what we're doing. Kind of like America saying, God don't know what we're doing. He seeth not. He that hath made the eye, shall he not see? Shall he not hear? The Lord hath forsaken the earth. And he said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz for 40 days. You remember I told you all about they started weeping for Tammuz on March, on, the, on the, uh, February the 15th to the 25th of March. That's 40 days. They wept for Tammuz. So that he would resurrect from the dead on what we call Easter or Ishtar. Easter is a goddess of the East, of the Saxons. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this that Israel is doing? Why, didn't, why do you think God scattered them? O, o son of man, turn thou thee yet again, and thou shalt see a greater abomination than these. And he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, brought him to, right into here, in the court, right in here, somewhere in there. He was standing right here in front of Solomon's porch. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between Solomon's porch and the altar, somewhere right here, right in there, stood 25 men facing the east, worshiping the sun, having a sunrise service 600 years before Jesus was even born, much less resurrected. Having a sunrise service. About five and 20 men and their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east and they worship the sun toward the east. And then he goes through all this Look down here in verse 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury with Israel. Mine eye shall not spare. I'll kill everybody that's left. Neither will I have pity, though they cry in mine ears, and with a loud voice yet I will not hear except for the ones that are believers. This is a picture. This is an Old Testament shadow of the end of time because he's going to have some men go out there and seal 
the believers in Israel. And they will know who they are. And they're going to be spiritual men. Spirits going and doing that. Now let's read in verse 9. Chapter 9. And he cried and also in, a, in mine ears with a loud voice saying. Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Tell them to bring their swords. People who are over the these people that are believers, they're godly. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, north end of the, of the surrounding. They come in here. Six men. This is the ceiling of the people in the Old Testament just like he's going to seal his people in the New Testament at the end of time. He's going to put his signature on these people. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate and lie toward the north and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand and one man among them was clothed with a linen and with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Here's the brazen altar right here. They're standing somewhere beside that brazen altar, these six men. And he says, And the glory of God of, God, of Israel was gone up from the cherubim, cherub or the cherub, whereupon he was no he was to the threshold of the house. The threshold is where you go into the house of God. That's the entrance right there. To the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had, who had the rider's inkhorn by his side. I don't know whether it was a spiritual man or it was a spirit or it was a literal man. Because he's the one that's going to mark the ones that are not to be killed. Just like sealing us at the end of time in the seventh chapter of Revelation. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark. This would be a sign. It would be a signature. It would be a Scratching, the word is tau, T-A-U. They said, go through the city of Jerusalem and set a mark. It means to desire. It's the desire of God to scratch upon them. It means a sign or a simeon. It has the same meaning as simeon, S-E-M-E-I-O-N. It means a flag or a signal, or something that marks them for God's possession. That's the same thing he does when he seals us with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. And set a mark upon the foreheads of the men, that sign. But you got to keep remembering that takes you back on the foreheads, takes you back to Deuteronomy 6. you got to remember, this is what God said. In Deuteronomy 6, he said, he said, take my law, put it on your forehead, put it where you walk, where you rise up, where you lie down, put it on your hand, put it on your forehead. That meant in the mind. On the forehead, meant, on the hand meant wherever you go, it, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this, as to whether this is a spiritual thing, a man can't just walk up to a man and start writing on his forehead. It has to be something spiritual about it because God knows who his people are. The Lord knoweth them that are here. He has let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And the Lord said in him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh. They're sad over what Israel has done. They're repentant. 
The only the ones that sigh and they repent it. And that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst of Israel. They're crying over it. They're people that are serious. These are the few. It's like us being the few. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city and kill. Smite those that I don't tell you. The word smite is the word nakah. N-A-K-A-H. N-A-K-A-H. It means to kill those. Let not your eyes spare, neither have any pity. This is a picture. This is a shadow of the end of time. He does it. This is right as Israel is about to be destroyed. Not Israel, but southern Judah. Jerusalem is in southern Judah. There's two tribes in southern Judah. Benjamin and, and Jerusalem and the tribe of Benjamin, that's where Jerusalem is. Slay utterly old and young, both maids, little children, and women. People say, God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't be that cruel. Yes, he will. But come not near any man upon whom is this mark, this signature that I've had him. Just because it says mark here, it's not the same thing as the mark of the beast. This is a signature. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. Do I have any time, Mike? Nine. Nine minutes. Maybe I can finish it. He said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. He's saying, Kill all these rejectors of Christ and put them in the court here of the house of the Lord. Kill them all. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them that I was left and I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, this is Ezekiel. But he's not there in person. He's in, a, he's in a vision of what's going to happen. Wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. They've gone after Baal and the grove. They've gone off to the same system that was brought in the church and called Christ's mass. That's what they've done. Do you think that's innocent? Not on your life. And the land is full of blood. The city full of per perverseness. You can read all about this in Jeremiah, the 39th and 40th chapter. For they say the Lord hath forsaken the earth and the Lord doesn't see what we're doing and we can perform all the sin that we want and that's what America is saying. And as for me also mine eyes shall not spare. I'll kill the kids. I'll kill their children. I'll kill the mothers and fathers. I'll kill the babes in their wombs. Will I have pity? but I will recompense their way up on their head. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about Jerusalem and southern Judah. Do you get it? He's not talking about foreigners. He's not talking about Egypt. He's not talking about Jordan, Ammon, and Moab. He's not talking about Lebanon. He's not talking about anybody but the Israelites because of what they've done. And behold, the man clothed with linen which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. And then he continues. Let me show you in the New Testament. He's going to mark us. Let's go to Revelation, the seventh chapter. Revelation 7. That is a shadow of the Old Testament of what God is going to do here. Revelation 7. After the verse 1, after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. They said the earth had four corners. They said it had 
it had a northeast corner, a southwest corner, and northwest corner, and a, and a southeast corner. It said the earth was a square. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He's got the signature of God. Cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till I have sealed the, all the servants of God in their foreheads or in their minds. That's what he's talking about. I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand. 144,000 is a figurative number. You have to go to the 14th chapter of this book to find out who they were. Of the children of Israel, and he starts naming who they were. Of the tribe of Judah, he sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Of Gad, 12,000. Of Asher, 12,000. Of Nephilim, 12,000. Of Manasseh, wait a minute. Manasseh is the oldest son of of Joseph and they're not supposed to be numbered with Israel of the tribe of Simeon 12,000 of the tribe of Levi wait a minute Levi was never numbered with Israel never you'll find that in Numbers the first chapter Numbers the eighth chapter Levi was never numbered this is not a correct numbering of Israel because Levi is numbered the Bible says so so what are the 144,000? Look at, you can read on through this, and he's talking about a great crowd around the, around the throne of God. But go to the 14th chapter, and it'll tell you who these are. 14th chapter. And I looked in lower, verse 1, lower lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having the Father's name written in their foreheads, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder, and heard the voice of harpers harping with harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. That takes a lot of explanation. The four beasts were the beasts that were one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant and two, one of them, two of them woven into that veil. That's the four beasts with the head of a lion, the head of an ox, the head of an eagle, and man. That was the four that God had formed a covenant with when Noah came out of the ark. Everywhere you find that, that's showing the covenant. And then he says, They sung as it were a song before the four beasts and elders, and the elders, 24 elders, which were the descendants of, uh, of Ithamar and Eliezer, no man could learn the song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. The ones that redeemed are the wife, the bride of Christ. These are they which were not defiled with women. These are virgins. When you look at the first 11th chapter of Second Corinthians, it says, I have espoused you to one, one wife. You can look at that and it'll tell you, talking about I've espoused you that you will be virgins to Christ as he says that in the 11th chapter he says verse 2 I'm jealous of you with a godly jealousy for I've espoused you to one husband that I may present the church at Corinth as a chaste virgin to Christ the inner man can't sin so he's a virgin and he says these are they, there back in verse 4 of chapter 14, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb. Whether he goeth, these were they that were redeemed from men, being the first fruits unto God. When you look at James, the first chapter, he says, of his own will begat he us, that we might be a kind of first fruits. That's the church. The 144,000 is a figurative number. 12 times 12 is 144,000. 
12 times 12,000. It's a figurative number for the church. When they, when they fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, they gathered up to baskets so that none would be lost, and they gathered up 12 baskets of bread. 12 is the number of the total church, and 7 is the number of the refined church. I would say more, but I don't, I don't have any time. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm out of time. Lord, thank you for truth. Thank you for this word. We love you for your word. We want to tell it to everybody. Lord, we pray that you'll give us strength to continue. And Lord, help this message to go out and fight our battles for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. was a lot of stuff, wasn't it? Hey. Good to see you. I gotta get all this guns. up. You got a permit for these? Huh? You got a permit for these? <laughs> permit for those? Dangerous weapons to the world. But they're. Yeah. Well, I'm not worried about the world. But they're tools of the flesh. trade for us. You don't want to take them. About. That is my world. Got it. Yeah. Let me take this off.